Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, with a continuing emphasis on that most wonderful subgenre, steampunk. Today our topic is fantasy, and specifically the young people's classic Watership Down by Richard Adams, published in 1972, Rex Collins. Before we get started, I'd like to talk some more about my own work. I have several works of fiction available on Amazon, and I've talked about my novels, and some written together with Mrs. Desperado, uh, but I'd like to talk also about some of my short stories, including one called Found Pet, which is kind of a Twilight Zone uh, story of a man who finds a mysterious animal that has unusual powers. And it's kind of, a, it's a little, it's a little on the adult side, but check it out, I think you'll like it. So back to our scheduled program. As I said, Watership Down is a fantasy novel by Richard Adams, British writer. Uh, generally a classic, a very popular children's book. It came out at a time when I was too old to be interested, uh, thinking because it was about, about rabbits, it was a little kid's book. I didn't know that it was actually aimed at older, at older young people, and so I never, I never read it. In fact, I kind of forgot about it when I was introducing my son to classics and literature. Uh, but uh, I came across recently. I came across a video on a channel called Morgoth Review that where the author who tends to view, um, tends to view things from a right-leaning political standpoint, uh, viewing uh, Watership Down as political allegory. And I became very fascinated with this, so I decided to check that, check it out, and I ended up getting the audiobook version, uh, narrated by Peter Capaldi, who is very talented, has a lot of great voices, and makes it more enjoyable. And uh, I really found it fascinating. I think it's a work that a lot of adults would be interest with, uh, interested in as well. Now, I know a lot of you have probably seen it already or read it already, uh, but there's a surprising number, especially here in America, who have not. And so, therefore, I, I felt compelled to talk about it. Uh, again, it's not for little children. It's got a lot of uh, mature themes, such as, uh, as death and mating and so forth. So, uh, and some philosophical themes that would go right over the heads of little kids. So I definitely would recommend it for anybody, you know, teenage or older for sure. Yeah, 10, 10 years old and older, I think, depending upon your reading level. It won several, it won several prizes. Uh, the Carnegie Medal and the Guardian Prize in Britain. It was adapted several times as an animated film in 1978, uh, directed by Martin Rosen. It was an animated children's seri TV series in 1999 to 2001, and there was a new Netflix version, 2018, uh, which I have watched the first out of the four episodes, which correspond to the four parts of the book. So it's interesting because one of the things that Adams says in his introduction, which is written several years later, is that the book is not an allegory. Even though Morgoth saw it as an allegory, and I actually did too, I think it was probably subconsciously so. So I think a lot of writers have these ideas in the back of their head and that they come out in, in the story, even if they may not have set out to do so. Yes, it is a novel about rabbits. That's, that's, the, that's the big issue. And, uh, and that's, again, why a lot of people mistook it as being for small children. Specifically about two brothers, Hazel and Fiverr. Uh, they live in a warren uh, near Sandalford in uh, Hampshire, a county of Hampshire in England. It's a real place. All places are real. And it's kind of a semi-idyllic life. And Fiverr, he's the runt of the litter. He's an odd little fellow, and he has, this, he has these dreams of premonitions. And he has this dream of disaster, like... The warren's going to be destroyed, and, and they're all going to die. And he, and he convinces his brother, Hazel, to take it up with the, the warren's chief rabbit. The chief rabbit is poo-poos their concerns, and basically that Fiverr is crazy, and he's very angry 
with the uh, the rabbit guard that let them in to talk to him, that let them in to bother him. And uh, so the two of them think about it, they talk about it, and, and because Hazel trusts his little brother, he decides that yes, they are going to leave and strike out for strike out on their own to try and find a new home. And they talk several of their friends into joining them, and interestingly enough, the rabbit guard, who had been disciplined by the chief rabbit, and he comes along also because he's angry at how he had, how he was treated. Uh, and after that, they have a number of harrowing life and death adventures and on and their way to finding a new home and the real life place of Watership Down. Now this became, this Came into, came into being, this story came into being as a series of improvised stories that Adams would tell his young daughters on car trips through England. And uh, so it has nothing to do with submarines. <laughs> a lot of people might think that. It's just the name of the place, down being a type of geographical uh, feature and watership just being its, just being its name. Uh, and yes, it is a real place as are all the places described in the book. Well, the reason I say that it's, it's interesting for older people, not just young people, is that there's a lot of real-life biology in here, a lot of, of the ways that rabbits actually live. And in a way, it's, it's, a, it's a hallmark of the best kind of fantasy, which is based in reality with some twist. Uh, uh, much as steampunk is based on history with some twist that makes things different, the same thing is here. I mean, the rabbits, in every way, are rabbits. And they live in holes and they eat grass and so on. And they, uh, but in this case, they can talk and they can think and plan. Uh, like Kipling's animals in in the Jungle Book, they don't do things that the animals technically couldn't. You know, they don't you know, walk on hind legs and uh, you know pick up tools and stuff like that and dress in clothing, uh, like wind in the willows or whatnot. Uh, they are more or less rabbits with this human-like characteristics, and it just it's it's fascinating. I, it was I was very surprised and pleased at how interesting it was. There are a number of things I really liked about it. First of all, they're great characters. Hazel, uh, the reluctant leader, uh, his uh, quirky little brother Fiverr, uh, the rabbit guard, um, he was a member of the rabbit council, or Ausla, it's called, and Big Wig, he's a real character, a real brawler, uh, and there's memorable villains such as General Woodwart, which we'll get, we'll mention him later, and all sorts, all sorts of cool characters. Uh, there's uh, the clever Blackberry. Uh, the Joker, the rabbit called called Bluebell, and the storyteller Dandelion, and uh, they all you become fond of them all. Now the rabbits have a language which uh, which Adams invented. He calls it Lapine, and uh, they've they've got they speak in English in the book, of course, but there's a lot of rabbit-specific words, such as such as Silfray, which means to go above ground and feed. In fact, I've, uh, according to Wikipedia, that word has actually been adopted by a lot of people actually use that to mean that rabbit behavior. Uh, in other words, LL, which is any predator, uh, including man, and uh, Rudadu, which uh, is a description of any sort of human vehicle, which they're not sure, the rabbits really aren't sure if they're alive or not. And uh, and uh, there's a number of others, but these these are the most notable. The rabbits have their own mythology, which is really awesome, and that's how the that's how the movie starts uh, and how the Netflix series starts uh, with their creation myth. And uh, their god is Frith, the sun, and and their hero is the trickster Elorela. And in the in the beginning. All animals were herbivores, but El Arela wouldn't control his people, and they were the rabbits were overpopulating the earth. So Frith called the animals together, and he assigned each of them a role, and he turned some of them into carnivores. 
all of which loved to eat rabbit. In compensation, he gave Elorella's people, he gave them long legs for running, uh, a puffy tail to confuse the enemies, long ears to hear them, and uh, that's why they had to become tricksters. That's why they always had to use their wits to survive. And there's throughout the book, there's all sorts of cool stories, little vignettes they tell about the uh, about uh, the rabbits, uh, the rabbits hero, and how you know this happened, and and you know the time that he stole the king's lettuce and so forth. I love those the rabbit names. You've heard some of them. They're all. They're mostly plant-based, but there's some are descriptive, like Big Wig. My favorite was Speedwell. What a great name for a rabbit. If I actually ever had a pet rabbit, I would name him Speedwell, for sure. There's also Looney Gull, uh, called Kahar, and he's, he's kind of a... Well, at one point, at one point Hazel decides that they should uh, help other animals to try and to get allies. And they rescue Kahar, he's injured, and they feed him till he can, till he can uh, fly again. And he, in return, he performs aerial reconnaissance for them, which comes in really handy uh, later. He speaks a kind of fractured language they call hedgerow patois, which is what, the way they communicate with other animals. And, and he, to me, in the, at least in the audiobook, he sounds kind of like a Norwegian uh, Rastafarian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you... You go, you go now, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, I also love that chapters have an epigraph at the beginning, some quote from Shakespeare or other notable work, uh, and uh, and some really good action scenes. There's a battle between the two rabbit, robot armies. There was as stirring as anything I've read in military fiction. I've read a lot of military fiction lately, so it, that's a real compliment. What don't I like about Watership Down? Uh, well. The narrator sometimes tells things that are apparent from the text, uh, such as uh, Hazel was gaining confidence as a leader, and he, he was that he didn't had lacked before. But it's kind of apparent from the story. Some of the epigraphs are not in English, and they uh, and uh, you know Brits often in their books they will have things in French, because so many English people learn French. Most of us Americans do not, <laughs> and so we need a translation. Um, but uh, yeah, there's not much to complain about. It's it's really pretty cool. As we, regarding the allegories or the perceived allegories, there are a couple different uh, rabbit societies that they encounter, and one is an unnamed Warren. They meet a character called Cowslip, another rabbit, and he invites them to join. And it's a very kind of a spooky place. Fiverr has a bad feeling about it, and it's very decadent. You know, they are, they're kind of morose, they're all unhappy, they're all obsessed with death. And it reminds me, bear with me, it reminds me of our current American, uh, European, Western society. How, um, because these rabbits, it, it turns out, they're all fat and uh, they live comfortably. Because humans are feeding them in order to prey, in order to harvest them. And they accept that. And it reminds me a lot of how Americans... Uh, accept uh, we accept our affluent lifestyle and we accept all these control by the big corporations and the exploitation we accept that uh, despite the fact that it's not leading us in a good into a good place and so I think a lot of particular I think Adams if he were still alive would be very reluctant to see that parallel but I definitely saw it as did as, as did more of the second interesting rapid society was called Ephipha and it's another, another Lapine word, but it was a totalitarian society. I and led by General Woonwort, Wun, <laughs> and he was kind of like the rabbit Stalin. I mean, he was, it was cruel, and he would have other rabbits killed, and he, he wouldn't let anyone escape from the warren, even though they were overcrowded, and people were, people, <laughs> rabbits were unhappy, and, uh, and he didn't like any competitors. I mean, as with communism, he couldn't stand other rabbit societies, other rabbit-free societies. He wanted to get rid of them. He wanted to, to uh, overthrow them. And uh, it took some of the heroes prisoners, and there's some harrowing, um, 
some harrowing uh, action when uh, for them to escape. There's also an, a pretty cool action scene that I forgot to mention, uh, not really allegory, but where they rescue some hutch rabbits from a nearby farm, and, and be in particular because it turns out they were all male, <laughs> and they needed some females in order to perpetuate this, their society. And I love it. the rabbits are very forward thinking. They're not, you know, they're not just focused on themselves. Uh, in the, the very selfish way of a lot of people in modern and modern Western society, they they want to think about their progeny. They want to have a legacy. They want to have have uh, children hand hand down this legacy too. And I really love that about that this book. One of the things I treasured most about it. A little bit about about Richard Adams. He had trouble publishing this book uh, because, as as I said, rabbits are considered something that little children are fascinated with. And so a lot of the publishers assumed it was a little kid's book, but it was written in a very adult fashion with a lot of adult themes like life and death and uh, not really so suitable for little kids. It was a lot like um, the, the dilemma that Madeline L'Engle had in publishing the classic work uh, Wrinkle in Time because L'Engle's work had a lot of religious lore in it, which a lot of the secular publishers did not like, and yet her religious lore was very quirky and, and uh, different, so Christian publishers wouldn't touch it either. And so she she persevered, just like Adams did, eventually getting their, their non-conforming, very unusual works published. And as, as a writer, I appreciate that, because I've known a lot of other writers who have had that same problem. Their works didn't really fit in a nice uh, niche, a little box that they try to force us into, and uh, but these works ended up being classics, prize winners. It's because some publisher was was willing to take a chance. The other thing about Adams is interesting is he didn't become a full-time writer until the age of 52. He worked with the British Civil Service, and uh, after the great success of Watership Down, he became a full-time writer. He wrote, published another number of other books. Uh, Shardic, which has to do with some uh, fantasy people kingdom where there's this giant bear that's their, their totem animal, I guess. And the Plague Dogs, which is about some two dogs that escaped from a biological experimental facility. I haven't read either of those. Uh, but uh, and he had a very successful career, lived to the age of 96. And so a lot of us who started a little older age can take heart in that. As far as the adaptations, again, I've only seen the Netflix first episode. It was okay. It was pretty much followed the story. Uh, one of the things that they tried to do, and I noticed in, that, um, I believe Borgoff mentioned this, that some critics didn't like how there weren't enough female characters. They tried to give them a bigger role, and as they did in this. And uh, they also made it more exciting. They made they put in more conflict between the uh, between the major characters. Big Wig is a lot more of a jerk. <laughs> he, he's uh, you know actually threatening to kill uh, the other members of his party if they don't behave themselves. And I don't recall him being this aggressive. Although he was aggressive, I don't recall him being so much in the book. And there's a lot of you know, exciting scenes that are a little bit like they escape from a crow, and here, in this case, it's a whole flock of them. And uh, so there's just, for whatever reason, I don't know, there's there's some missing, there's something missing in the part I've seen so far, in that it's not as charming and genteel, and the, the, a lot of philosophy, the philosophy isn't there. The, uh, the stories about El Arela are mostly missing. And I know you can't only do so much in uh, four 50-minute episodes, but it's still something that, that, that I would definitely miss. This is my, my review of Watership Down, the book, specifically the audio book, so I definitely recommend it. I, I highly recommend it. I give it five gears out of five because it's a book that I believe that adults can appreciate as much as young people can. And now, brief addendum. I recorded this a few days back, and since then I've gotten a chance to watch the 1978 full-length animation of Watership Down, and I must say I was impressed. It was really good. 
it seems to me to be a lot closer to the spirit of the original uh, than the more modern Netflix version, even though the Netflix version, of course, the animation is spectacular, you know, very wonderful 3D stuff, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't denigrate it, too, it's pretty good as well, but definitely we have that philosophical feeling of the original, the, of the book, and even with the life and death and, and the struggles and the violence, a little bit of a melancholy, perhaps, and it really comes across in the kind of genteel, tranquil background of this, of this uh, animation, including the, the music and so on, the, uh, the character voices, and, and so forth. I highly recommend it. For now, this has been the Steampunk Desperado at the Steampunk Desperado channel. Saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.